Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'd like to welcome you to our May 2018 Contemplative Education Webinar, A Heartful Way of Living, with Stephen Murphy Shigematsu. I'm Maya Alanevsky, the Events and Outreach Manager here at the Center for Contemplative Mind in Society. I want to take a quick moment to mention an exciting new campaign that we've just kicked off, which is our Access Grant Fund. We have a $5,000 match challenge, and 100% of the funds raised will go directly to Access Grants supporting attendance at our events. I'll send you a link so that you may donate if you'd like today. Now I'd like to give you a little background about our presenter. Stephen is a psychologist at the Stanford University School of Medicine and School of Humanities and Science. He co-founded the LifeWorks program of in integrative learning and teaches in leadership innovations, wellness education, and comparative studies in race and ethnicity. His consulting practice with American and Japanese organizations is based in mindfulness, emotional intelligence, and compassion, integrating Eastern and Western wisdom and science. He received a doctorate in psychology from Harvard University and was professor at the University of Tokyo. His books that are both in Japanese and English include The Stanford University Mindfulness Classroom, published in 2016, and From Mindfulness to Heartfulness, Transforming Self and Society with Compassion, and The Stanford Way of Leadership, both published in 2018. We are extremely excited to have you with us here today. Please welcome Stephen. I can hear the applause over the internet here. It's kind of strange feeling to be talking. Um, I feel like I'm talking to myself or the, the dog who's around here, but it's, I know that, or I assume there are people out there listening. So I will talk as if um, I am talking uh, to people who are listening wherever they are, and I'm in my own home. Um, so feeling quite comfortable, but also a little bit strange. I'd like to begin with a prayer, which I have been uh, told is a Franciscan prayer. Oh my God, you are here. Oh my God, I am here. Oh my God, we are here. This is a, a prayer I often start the day with and uh, find myself repeating it uh, throughout the day. And it's, it's for me a way that I start to ground myself in um, just that first of all, the part about that uh, you are here is embracing that sense of mystery, which is often so uh, elusive in the kinds of uh, institutions that we work in. Uh, certainly the universities don't have much respect for mystery, uh, but we're certainly obsessed with mastery and control and that our way of viewing uh, things, including nature, is a way of uh, trying to uh, master and control and uh, so for me it brings up this sense of um, uh, not knowing which is of course something that's difficult for us to embrace uh, in a university but this sense of what is it that we really don't know and that can we embrace that mystery of life which is really even parts of, of what we think of as more academic uh, categorizations of art and science and can we even embrace that strangeness of uh, being here being alive not knowing what that is about in some ways but sensing sometimes that we we do sometimes we can really feel that and we sense that there's a purpose for our existence and uh, saying that there's also a um, acknowledging that there's something beyond us, I think, is also a way that we can bring in beginner's mind, bring in that sense that of 
it's something completely new that we're we're con looking at in terms of the reality that we see at any moment and um, this is also of course difficult for for all of us and for all of our students too to really get rid of our cynicism and um, you know the, the sense that we've we've been there done that this is all old we know how to we've had webinars before we've had classes before we've had all kinds of things before and um, and start to doubt whether anything really amazing is going to happen but if we can approach it with that sense of wonder in the beginner's mind and that sense of infinite possibility uh, it also brings in this expression in Japanese Ichigo Ichie uh, which comes from the tea ceremony um, and that the awareness Ichigo simply means one um, moment and Ichi A means the uh, one coming together. So the coming together in any particular moment in life, uh, if we can experience it as a wonder, as a miracle, as a mystery, how we all happen to be here together at this particular moment, then even in something as mundane as the tea ceremony, we can begin to feel that the richness of life if we can actually be present at that moment. Um, I've got a lot of Einstein at the beginning, but um, it's partly because I grew up with a very disillusioned father who had uh, grown up Irish Catholic and um, took refuge in Einstein as a way of, I think, his own form of religion. And so I, I grew up with lots of Einstein quotes and it's still uh, they still stay with me. And I feel like that's something that when I think of the second part of the prayer of that I am here, um, you know, certainly we are aware of our own individuality in the sense of individual isolation and existence within our own minds and bodies and consciousness. Um, but I think many of us feel that, that this in the sense of a delusion, that this is a delusion of our consciousness and that we are here to really overcome that. And we overcome that by expanding our circle of compassion and extending it beyond those who we are closest to and closest to us. But, uh, and if we can extend that beyond, we free ourselves from this prison of all living creatures and to the universe and nature itself. And, um, and the sense of we-ness in the prayer, I think evokes this, uh, the deep human longing for connection, connection with others to the, uh, the title of this book written by a blind and deaf professor at the university I worked in in Japan uh, is, uh, I think, brings out that sense of the essential nature of how we, we are living uh, to be connected to others and to realize that connection uh, and that our very existence depends on others uh, is the way that we also experience that we-ness. I personally have had a hard time to be in a situation like this in which I'm talking and other people are listening and I it makes me think why why am I talking and why are other people listening and um, it was something I started to try I overcame uh, by words of wisdom like in these in the Gnostic Gospels that bringing forth what's in you is is actually something that saves us uh, the second part of this is if you do not bring forth uh, what is within you, it will destroy you. And so this has helped me to really feel the basic nature of um, expression and bringing forth what it is that we are given. And certainly many people at the end stages of life will often will say things like you know, that I, the meaning of life just seems to be to do the best with what you've got and to that's certainly part of our greatest part of our challenge to have the courage to actually bring forth what's in us. Um, I got more encouragement from that when I was um, a student uh, by the, uh, my, my mentor in, in graduate school uh, explaining how he was when he was studying with healers in different societies that they would often say tell our story to your people and when he said what do I say he they would say say simply what you know and no more and no less. And so that's the way I move forward. And I also think about 
uh, you know, when I often using myself as a learn something to teach and learn, I think of something that uh, Ram Dass said about that that's simply a way that uh, you can live using your own life as a form of teaching. Um, it's just your story, but it can be told in a way that it could be everybody's story and it could be simply a way that um, other people uh, helps other people to reflect on their life and that's the um, something anybody could do um, it's just that some people choose to do it and some people don't and I also grew up with a Japanese mother who uh, seemed to rarely speak uh, which was a good thing because my Irish father was always talking so there would have been uh, there was too much competition but um, I'm also feeling often more and more in life like this sense of what the uh, the great haiku poet Basho wrote about what's the point of saying everything with words or the way that Rumi expressed, expressed that the divine in me has never spoken a word. And I also take refuge in Gibran's words about as I find myself seeking more silence and um, that there's something in the silence that you can learn and then may be uh, expressed in words, even though there is the, that ultimate sense of futility that you could ever really express it in words. And yet, like these poets, um, many of us keep trying because that is well, that is one way we know how to do it. And so to keep trying, even if we know that we can't really teach a lot of things, uh, but we know that people can learn. One way that I found it helpful to, to speak is through stories. Um, and finding that this uh, storytelling is a way that I feel most comfortable in expressing what I'm experiencing, um, expressing what I have gone through in life, and that it's a way that there's a power to the stories that really is, um, I think, expressed in these two uh, characters that we can see often great meaning in symbols that people have developed over centuries. And these come from China originally, I learned them uh, in, in Japanese, but the, they're very similar. If you see the left one is about what it means, a story, and the right is about uh, satori or enlightenment. And there, the, you can see that the right side is similar, and the left side, the difference is that the story shows a word, and the enlightenment shows a heart. And so uh, to me, this symbolizes that sense that the stories are getting close to enlightenment, but it's the movement from the word to the heart that is what enables enlightenment. Um, and I feel like I'm often, that's often what we're looking for is this sense of uh, speaking from the heart. And I remember in one of my classes, I told the students to stop talking because I was, wasn't feeling that they were speaking from the heart. And I, um, so uh, I said, only speak if you think that what you have to offer is more valuable than the silence. Uh, so, after having been told that by the teacher, nobody said a word for, and it went on to five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and about 20 minutes, I think, before um, the woman on the left uh, started to sing. And it was uh, a beautiful feeling of that words from the heart uh, were uh, something that could penetrate that, that emptiness that we often feel in that, what's that George Benson song? Uh, Tried to talk it over, but the words got in the way. That, that sense in which I think we often feel in universities, we're just overwhelmed with words that often are creating a fog of confusion and really hiding what is really meant to be said most deeply from the heart. And that's, of course, something that uh, we who teach often set the lead, lead by our example of trying to avoid the heart. And uh, there's a, uh, I was told by a, a professor at my university that the, uh, we don't, um, after I demonstrated the way I teach, we don't do that here because we simply uh, leave ourselves at the door so that uh, we don't bring ourselves into the classroom. And of course, that's, if we don't do that, we don't invite students to do the same. Um, and I try to be something that is a, uh, symbolized by these, what are called kanji uh, of the sensei. So the sensei uh, is some, simply someone who comes before you. Uh, 
and that's something that can be simply an age matter of age but it could also be something that's a matter of um, experience some of us have had certain experiences in life uh, that others have not had and that can also be a sense of of uh, coming before someone else and you know, experiencing something. So if you're Grateful Dead uh, fans, you might recognize that the top there, it comes from this, the quote comes from Ripple. Uh, if I knew the way, I would take you home, which is a, a way that I feel that, you know, we can, we can be a sensei, we can be a teacher, but without having really knowing where we're going, where they're going, but uh, with that intention and with that uh, commitment, to be a guide for our students. But I've come to think of myself uh, as kind of a baka sensei. Baka is, if you know any Japanese, it means a fool. And so if you look at the kanji for that, there's a horse and a deer. So it evokes that sense of the fool as somebody who looks at the horse and says it's a deer. Uh, and so it's meant also as a way of of uh, disorienting, and if we think of in transformative learning, the disorienting dilemma, and creating some discomfort in our students, uh, some sense of disorientation that they can't rely on what, all the ways they've come to understand things, but we want to disrupt that somewhat so that they start to think of uh, the realities that their way of seeing things is different from the way other people see things, and then hopefully they can bring themselves into that moment. Uh, so that, this kanji is one that comes from, uh, it's pronounced nen, and you can see how it's made up of two parts, now and the heart. And so it really brings up that sense of presence, of really being present uh, in, in the sense that uh, we can see in people, uh, teachers like Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, and even describing that as a miracle to be present, uh, and how that miracle can really uh, help others to also blossom, to bloom like flowers. Um, but we know that that's difficult for us. We have wandering minds like Snoopy and that those wandering minds get us into trouble. Uh, I mean, we're basically checked out half the time. Um, not unlike my dog, who is very mindful, you can see when you look into his eyes that he's awake and aware and attentive and accepting. And we'd go for walks, you have a sense that while your mind is racing and, and going into the past and going into the future and worries, 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 thoughts, 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 and the dog just seems to be there. Just like kids, I was a kindergarten teacher for four years and worked in daycare and um, that was always the joy of working with kids. They were there when I wasn't and they would call you to be with them, say, come back, come here, be in this present moment with us. Uh, and one way we do that is through meditation. Um, and that's something that you know, I'm uh, very fortunate in the place I work because there's this um, new center that is only for meditation. Um, and it's a place where I begin my classes. So I'm able to begin, take the students there and to begin the class with a period of, of contemplation. I take uh, students there a lot. Um, and I think what I'd like to do is just a very short, um, is it gonna be here or am I gonna do it later? Um, yeah, loving kindness meditation. But it's often I take students there who are, um, and we're trying to go beyond what is this sense of uh, busyness, which is something that our universities are, uh, intentionally doing to keep students from, I think, really thinking about the deeper questions of life, because we as teachers don't want to deal with those. And we know that that's a lot messier than just keeping them busy and keeping them uh, to, uh, with tasks to do. And that if you look at this kanji, you see that the left side means the heart and the right side is death or loss. And so it, it really brings up that sense that the opposite of mindfulness is busyness, and that our minds, when we are always busy, uh, and often purposely so, that we are not being really present there. Um, 
So let's uh, pause for a moment. I've been uh, talking a lot and I'll be talking a little bit more. Um, but if we could just pause for a moment and do a very brief loving kindness meditation. So if you could get yourself into a comfortable position and if you're comfortable to close your eyes uh, and to begin to focus on your breath. And I'm gonna play a little background music which I like to use. Um, and uh, just focus on your breath. Maybe taking a deep breath in. And releasing it slowly. Another deep breath. Inhaling deeply. And exhaling. Inhaling, and exhaling. And breathing naturally, and bringing your attention to your heart center. If it feels good for you to put one hand or both hands over your heart. And to say these words to yourself. May I be well. May I be happy. May I be peaceful. May I be loved. May I be well. May I be happy. May I be peaceful. May I be loved. Bring your attention again to your heart center. Imagine the warmth the compassion that you have you can extend to yourself, self-compassion, self-care. And if you can bring to your mind the image of someone who has cared for you, someone who has loved you, given their life for your life. You might imagine this person before you. And you say these words to that person, extending the compassion that you feel. May you be well. May you be happy. May you be peaceful. May you be loved. May you be well. May you be happy. May you be peaceful. May you be loved. Bring your attention again to your heart center. Feeling that sense of warmth and compassion for yourself others you can 
Focus again on your breath. And your attention to your breathing in and breathing out. Feel ready to open your eyes again. So I use this partly to show the kind of uh, world that I exist in, in terms of uh, bringing contemplative practice into the classroom. Yeah, so in a university setting, and that it feels like this sense of um, certainly uh, to get the courses approved and to get uh, students to, many students to enroll in the courses and then to highly evaluate the courses, it requires um, not only these practices, uh, but an explanation of the practices in terms of what we think of now as evidence. Right? Uh, people are always looking for evidence. And so we, there are people studying uh, loving kindness meditations and, and coming up with results that say that these are ways in which we can uh, have evidence that these things really work. And so I feel um, we're involved, many of us, in the sense of integrating technologies and looking at, at the technologies that come from human development, uh, from you know, even hunter-gatherer societies of, of uh, addressing the shortage of healers with community rituals. Um, and something that we do today in uh, self-help support groups, AA groups, um, addressing what can never be the need that can never be met by highly trained professionals um, by with support groups um, and using traditional cultural sources of well-being like the loving kindness meditation and it's um i think we're in that uh, integration of also looking at how do we do something meet the same goals with um uh, these new technologies of, that are often machines and um, which we think of as technology, but it's simply another form of how humans are developing things to make life better. And then how do we use that evidence also to get people to allow us to teach these things in places that have not respected them before. And that these, this is a great use of this kind of new technology. So the kinds of things that I, been doing in the university are all based on the sense of community healing that communities uh, have engaged in healing uh, work for generations and it's also in this sense that um, modern uh, people recently like grace lee boggs have talked about our need to be in uh, in small groups of where we gain or regain our humanity uh, and that that is something that is being, you can see in, in many different places, and that may be the best thing we can do often to combat uh, the lack of hope and the despair that we feel uh, when we look at the destruction of the world around us. Um, and that can often lead us to a pessimism, but it's in these small groups that I think that we re-engage and re reinforce our sense of, of vitality and uh, re-engagement with the struggle. Um, and so if this is, these are the kinds of communities that I'm developing within the university. And um, one of the themes, I'll introduce just one theme now because of the time, but it's this sense of uh, another way of uh, looking at this is that the opposite of mindfulness is forgetfulness. That if we forget who we are, uh, forget who we are as a human being, then we have um, lost a connection. This shows the, the top part is the um, loss or death and the bottom part is a heart. So that sense of 
the word forget, meaning that we have lost touch with what is really uh, makes us human. And um, that is certainly tied in with this Japanese expression, the mono no oware, the sense of awareness of impermanence and that our own, that life is something that we have come to, uh, we come to with the awareness that it is a, uh, we're here just for a brief moment. And my, I think I'll show one video and because of the time, but uh, this is a scene from The Last Samurai, just a two minute video that um, type of thing that I use often in classes to demonstrate uh, uh, a very big, basic and uh, important principles. So, I so just, we're gonna, there's, a link, yeah. there's a link that's going out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just sent it to everyone in a chat. Okay, so what's... Stephen, I apologize. I don't think the link is working. Okay. Okay, we'll go without them then. Okay. Um, Sorry, everybody. It's okay. <laughs> um, so there's not a lot of time anyway. So, um, but I wanted to show it just uh, as an example of the kinds of um, uh, films I use. Uh, some of them are Hollywood. Some of them are I, uh, I have a use the Lion King and the Star Wars, but this particular one uh, shows this sense about um, what what the uh, they call Bushido, which is the way of the warrior, the samurai way, and that it means remembering that we are dying, remembering that we are all living beings like the blossoms uh, here, just for a brief moment, uh, and that we're all in the process of dying, and that awareness connects us both to our own vitality, but also to that of all others, that we are constantly aware that this is uh, the very gift or the very uh, opportunity that exists in any moment of, of life, if we can actually be there in that sense of, I mentioned before, Ichigo Ichie, which is also very similar to this samurai sense of being present. Um, let me, um, maybe what I'll do is simply to give one, one story, uh, and because of the time, but, uh, the story I wanted to tell, uh, is, uh, illustrates one of the principles that I often teach, and it's about how, um, well, I'll just tell the story first. So I grew up in, uh, we came from Japan. I grew up in Western Massachusetts in a small city called Pittsfield where um, we were very, uh, received a lot of attention because they had never seen anybody from Asia before. And it was um, not that long after the end of the war. So a lot of the attention was not too uh, positive, but I was, um, I was an aggressive kid and really wanted to go to summer camp. So my, my uh, dad allowed me, uh, lied for me and said I was older than I really was. And I went to the summer camp and Camp Russell. And it turned out there were a lot of tough kids there from all over the city who I had never encountered before, but who were uh, noticed that I was different and wanted to point that out to me. Uh, and so I was uh, treated to a lot of uh, verbal taunts, which um, but surprisingly, nobody tried to fight me. Then I heard one kid say, well, he knows, he knows karate, so don't, don't mess with him. And people would laugh, but they didn't, they didn't come on to me. And so I was able to get through it without any violence. But uh, uh, I remember that feeling, you know, even how it stayed with me. It went deeply into my body, that feeling of, of uh, fear and the, the feeling of that I would have to fight. And if I did fight, I would fight uh, till the end. And that, that was uh, a very very basic primitive feeling that I had. And um, well, when my parents came to visit, it was a two week camp, to, 
my father uh, she asked, how's it going? And I said, oh, it's great, you know, having a great time. And But I couldn't hold it in. I said, I started to cry. And it was the first time I'd ever cried, I think, in front of my dad, probably the last two. Um, because he was a tough Irishman who was had been teaching me how to box too, so I was ready. They'd been had a little boxing career going, and um, but he's uh, so I was afraid to cry in front of him. But he uh, held me, and he he said uh, he was rubbing my head, and he said that's okay, that's okay, Steve. And it was um, you know, it's hard to explain what happened, but I noticed that very quickly I had this, something moved inside of me and he said, that's okay, you can come home. And I said, I'm not going home, I'm staying. And when I look back on it now, I feel like what I was, what I received was this gift of acceptance of that I was, of my vulnerability, of my weakness, of that, you know, I was, even if he wanted me to be the tough kid who, uh, beat up everybody else, it was still, uh, it was okay that I was, I could be accepted for what I was. And it brought up that what I, you know, in later years studying about things like um, Japanese aesthetics and uh, the sense of what's called wabi sabi, the imperfect imperfection of all of us and the impermanence, the incompleteness. Um, and instead that um, uh, the importance of re, you know embracing our vulnerability, embracing our otherness, and then how that brings up not only the sense of mystery, but also, and that sense of beginner's mind, but also of compassion for ourselves and others, and how this is, uh, that embracing that is also, enables us to be more than what we are. It enables us to embrace those parts of us that we have, where we have been wounded, where we've been hurt, where we have, uh been scarred even and so the in closing i'll tell this last story about which is king sugi which is the story of the uh, beautiful pot that had been dropped and broken and uh, the owner returned it to the maker and said fix the pot um, he received it back and to his great surprise it was the cracks had been uh, put together with gold uh, and this is called kintsugi, and it's become an art form in which things are broken and are put back together in a way that is uh, highlights. It doesn't hide the scars. It doesn't hide the wounds or the fractures, or, but instead it highlights them. And it shows that these are what makes us what we are, who we are, and that they can even be our strongest points. It can be the places at which we have been uh, wounded, but also received the light. The light has come through those places and it, has, it enables us to actually sparkle and to be more than what we were. Um, this is a second story, which I think I won't tell but uh, because of time, but let me just jump ahead to how I see this uh, bringing us all together is this sense of um, that like this moon, we are all, when we ask when we think of who we are, we, we imagine ourselves to be far less than we really are in the part that's in the light. And we say, this is who we are. Um, but parts of us are so still hidden and so undeveloped and so unrealized. And so remembering, not forgetting is a process to me of uh, getting in touch with those parts, the parts that may have been our wounds or our traumas uh, and embracing those and, and using those uh, they also could be, though, our, in an opposite sense, our joys, the pleasures, the amazing uh, kinds of beginner's mind experiences we had when we were a child. I was just sitting by the side of a, a river in Tokyo. For some reason, I decided to stop at a place, and I stopped there, and I saw a little boy walk by with his mother, and he stopped, and he said, Mama, this is a mystery place. This is a mystery place. And the mother, <laughs> the mother said, like, yeah, 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 come on, let's go. You know, we don't want to be late. Uh, and that was the end. And he, the boy hurried on. And I thought, how many times, how many of us have had, had those experiences in which we discovered some kind of beautiful joy, wonder, awe, um, and we're told that that's not important. 
that there's other important, more important things in life. And so this, the wholeness may be something that is not just the, uh, the traumas or the wounds, but it could also be the joys and rediscovering those and bringing them to a greater uh, place of awareness. Um, if you saw the recent Star Wars movie, it's also in the sense about, you know, accepting who we are, that we can't, uh, we can't be always strong, we can't always be wise, and, but our roles as teachers or as masters is to help others to go beyond what we have done. And it was the evil in the uh, Star Wars that said, don't, don't worry, don't remember, that that's the way to become who you really are. The very you know, opposite message of accepting who you are with your weaknesses and follies and failures, and failures most of all is what is our greatest teacher. Um, well, I, I wish I had more time, but um, time is for all of us is limited, and so for me as for what as well as for you. But um, I wanted to give you simply a glimpse or a taste of kind of work that I'm doing, and that um, is probably most relevant to those of you who are working in universities. But it also is something that I'm. Uh, doing beyond the universities now and sending it to high schools and hopefully to uh, other levels of, of education that I think this very same principles can be used to uh, help the uh, classrooms and schools to become places where we bring the heart more into the, the uh, experience of students because that's what students tell us that remains with them. That it doesn't remain with them the kinds of approaches that we have of the very cognitive, rational, logical, analytical, critical level. Uh, those things uh, are extremely important, but we also know that they don't remain with you in the same sense that the wisdom that we get from stories that, uh, and the wisdom of the heart is something that remains with us and can help us to live better lives that are not just for ourselves, but also for uh, a greater good and that we can see that sense of compassion being extended beyond ourselves to to others and to society and that uh, hopefully that becomes a way that we renew our, our our desire to keep making a difference in in the world even when we see the world as so desperately in need of, of so much um, but we have to begin with ourselves and that's what um, I've tried to try to do in my work and um, I'm closing with, I'm looking at Yoda's photo and I'm remembering Yoda said, there is no try, there is do or do not. And so I, uh, I also accept that, that I, uh, we really need to do and to do it with the most uh, commit, sense of commitment and responsibility and intention and, and that it can be driven with our sense of compassion. So I'm gonna end here and hopefully we do have a few some time for questions and if you have questions I'm glad to engage with them. Yes, thank you so much Stephen. That was that was really wonderful. Um, and we do have time for questions. Um, at this point we'd like to invite you to type your questions in. Um, so we'll have a few minutes of silence on this end to give you a few moments to send those in and we'll begin shortly. I see they're already coming in, so we won't have to wait very long. <laughs> Okay, I think we'll get started and people can continue to submit questions. Um, the first question we got, which I have definitely heard before, um, in a rural university or university in a conservative region, getting contemplative ideas through to students is tough. Do you have any ideas? I start composition classes with a five-minute meditation and a five-minute journal writing. Some students love it, but a lot are just sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they sleep at uh, they sleep at every university I've been at. <laughs> but um, I just gave a talk. Um, yeah, that I that's a, a a great challenge that I often don't confront um, 
because my classes are electives and there are a number of students who really desire those classes. Um, but I do get students who are, um, one, one example is from Christian backgrounds, um, some, and I get a number of fundamentalist Christian students. Um, I just gave a talk at Washington Lee University in Virginia, which you know, a lot of the, the, uh, the students from Virginia Military Institute are there on campus, and it's, that's the place where Robert E. Lee was buried. And, uh, so you have a great conservative streak there, but I, it's also the, they have a tea, the tea house there. So I was also there for, um, did something in the tea house. Uh, but I think there's the, um, putting uh, mindfulness uh, as something that's Eastern is, um, I think, uh, can be a mistake in the sense that I think if we put mindfulness, frame it more as something that comes from many different cultural traditions, that it has um, more, uh, it can help to overcome some of that, the resistance that students feel. Um, I often mention that uh, Thomas Merton was one of my earliest influences um, in terms of uh, contemplative practice, and that that is, you know, obviously part of Christianity, and that it doesn't uh, it crosses those borders. Uh, um, I do. Uh, I like to do use um, if if you have possible the room, you know, some kinds of movement to yoga or qigong or um, Zen walking. Um, and uh, I find it helpful to bring in references to, um, like I have a, a football player comes into my class and talks about how important it's been to him. And uh, so people from different uh, society, social groups that they respect to bring those people uh, in or bring those voices in if you can, to show how uh, it's being embraced by people in, in, in groups that they may uh, respect and think that, okay, well, if that guy's willing to do it, uh, maybe I can try it too. Thank I'm going to keep my answers brief, just knowing that there are people who are, um, there may be a number of questions, but if you want to, uh, anybody wants to um, converse more, I'm very happy to converse by email or by messenger. Thanks, Stephen. Um, so we do have more questions. Um, the next one is, would you talk a bit about how you balance or integrate some of the practices you've discussed or others and material course content in day-to-day -day classes, perhaps with a story as example? Okay, um, yeah, that's a, that's a huge topic. And um, my class, cause, because my classes do include things like um, their basic, like I have a class called Heartfulness and I can just go into each, um, uh, cover the basic principles one by one, gratitude and compassion and, and so on. Um, but I often, uh, so I have taught within psychology, I've taught within to, uh, human biology, which is a pre-medical program. And so each course has to have a content that is you know, specific to that course. Um, so that the content has to vary, but um, I also teach a number of courses in comparative studies of race and ethnicity. And so let me just give you one example. Um, so the, the general principle of acceptance, uh, and that's this human, our tension between how much do we need to accept, you know, what you see in the serenity prayer to please give me the courage to, or the serenity to accept what I cannot change and the courage to change what I can change and the wisdom to know the difference is, um, so I introduced that in a, in a Christian way, but then I also introduced it in a Buddhist way. and a Japanese cultural way about a principle of shikata ganai. And I explain how that's something that is very similar, but also a little bit different from the, the Christian way of thinking about acceptance and how acceptance can be part of our lives. And so in, that, in a particular course, um, which is about actually race and ethnicity, I, I've used the example of the wartime incarceration of the Japanese uh, population on the West Coast and how that uh, acceptance and change became a very divisive factor in the community of the older generations saying we have to accept this, what the government has done to us uh, and go quietly. And then younger generation split between those who said we have to fight against uh, what the government has done to us by uh, refusing to cooperate with this incarceration. 
and then others saying that we have to go along with um, we have to, we can fight it the best by showing that we are loyal Americans and by going to serve in in Europe and uh, in sacrificing our lives for for this country and um, so I, I use a, a historical political <clears throat> uh, example for, uh, to in which I can highlight uh, other things like uh, racism and prejudice and the failures of, of governments and um, so I can talk about all those things and yet it's all centered around the basic concept of acceptance and how do we view this really uh, constant human challenge of do, can we accept something or can we do we have to try to change it and um, so that's just one example I, I can give you here, but uh, you know, you can imagine that if I teach a course in psychology, I bring in more psychological principles. If I do something in medicine, it has to be something like about biomedical ethical issues or things like that. But um, it can all, there's so much that you can find in uh, some courses, obviously more than others, some fields more than others. But um, I think that's the, there is certainly the, uh, a lot of people out there doing these kinds of things in different fields then uh, that's something that i get a lot out of when i go to the summer sessions is that sharing of ideas that uh, of people who are actually doing this in their in their classrooms thanks Stephen. um the next question and we might do one more after this um first of all the person asking wanted to thank you and saying said that it uh, was very moving. She wonders if you have students use their stories as you did in this webinar, and if so, if you could say a little bit about how you invite them to do that. Yeah, I think that's the, um, I put a lot on myself in terms of the beginning of the course, and I make a big dramatic presentation. I usually put on a kimono, and I come in and I speak in Japanese without saying anything in English for a while, and I. Um, and I, what one thing I explained to them, to them is I'm trying to uh, model bringing myself completely as I can into that uh, to be with them, and that I'm I'm only there because they're there, and that I'm will bring myself as much as I can as a human being to this, uh, into not just as the teacher, but as that sensei who is also just simply further down the road and is here to learn with you as well. I'm here to make this uh, something that is for all of us. And um, so I think that's that's the beginning. And then I ask them to also, uh, I think mindfulness becomes the path towards being more vulnerable, being more authentic. Um, and so we, we immerse, immerse ourselves in, in mindfulness from the very beginning and for every class. Uh, they also do self-reflective journals, which I think helps that process as well. And then the style of the classroom, there, I, I'm very lucky I can do 15 student seminars. So we sit in a circle and we um, practice a kind of uh, way of being together, which is not uh, part of that whole critical, analytical, logical, rational process that we do in schools. Um, but it's simply sharing stories and sharing, and everybody has a story. And so it, it also levels the playing field and those who have been really advantaged with the kind of education they've had and those who have had less advantage in that. And uh, everybody has a story. And so they, students who say they don't normally talk in classrooms, sometimes those are athletes, sometimes those are um, people with different kinds of marginalized identities who don't feel their views would be accepted. Or, um, they say they talk a lot because they realize that they have as much to offer as anybody else. They have a story like anybody else. And, that so we um, and we also value creative expression and that there's lots of use of of art and music and movement and ways that they can express themselves beyond the kind of rational you know argumentation that they're used to in classrooms and um, so I find all those things are helpful to help uh, for students to bring themselves as much as they can to the classroom and then to in by doing so to connect with others and to make that ideally that sense of a, of a community that we're, we're uh, striving for. Thanks, Stephen. Okay, so the, the last question that um, I'll read out loud, there's two very similar questions that 
are both sort of addressing the challenge of um, of integrating and contributing contemplative practices to the administration and staff of campuses and sort of um, talking about this outside of the classroom. Uh, you want me to just, just to respond to that in a general way? Yes, yeah, so, sorry. I guess the question is, um, how do you how do you see administration and staff contributing to um, contemplative campuses or? Um, I think that challenge varies quite a bit with the universities, but it's, it's. Um, I think we're constantly playing a game with, um, you know, in terms of what we can, how we frame what we do, and uh, also to meet the demands of a particular kind of mindset that administrators have about what is really valuable and what can be taught. And um, but it's something I've for years I have been. Uh, working with that, making proposals, and I've been able to get courses accepted in very conservative psychology department and pre pre med program. And um, everybody is moved by scientific evidence. It's just something that um, is hard for me to to accept, but I keep uh, re re you know re recognizing that this is the way things move here, and that if you can uh, show them something. Um, according to the values that they have, then they will say, okay. So like if I said to all the, in the psychology department, the, psych, the, the Dalai Lama says this, then they say, oh yes, yeah, so well, big deal. But if I say James Pennebaker did a controlled study about the, this and they say, oh, well, okay, then you can teach that because he's a legitimate scientist. And so what you're saying is really good evidence. and. Um, but it's a it's a constant game, and um, but sometimes we can look for new openings. So, for example, yes, yesterday I heard that the Stanford um, Office of Religious Studies has realized that they their programs are uh, not being used much by students because so many students today are not looking for specific religious specific programs, but are looking for something that they vaguely define as religious or even more as spiritual, and those programs don't exist, and so. There is the opening to talk about spirituality now, much more at the university than than there has been. And so, I think we have to play the game and really look at what what words uh, are helpful, and then to really accept that sense of the reality of that of the the science focus of universities, and that um, you know even the humanities are trying to are affected by physics envy and trying to show that they're real sciences. And I think we all have to do that to, to some degree and at different universities it, it varies but um, certainly it's, it's playing the game and using the words that will not trigger people but will hopefully move them in, in uh, the direction of, of accepting what we're saying. Thank you so much. Um, for those of you who, who submitted questions that we weren't able to address uh, I will download them and share them with Stephen. Stephen, I just want to thank you again so much for sharing your work with us and, and thank you to all of you for joining us. I do also want to remind you the webinar has been recorded and will be available on the website soon. Our webinars are made possible by your support and we invite you to make a donation and check out our webinar archive at contemplativemind.org. You may not be aware of this um, since we have such a wide reach, but in actuality, the Center for Contemplative Mind is just three full-time staff members. So your donations really do make a difference no matter what size they are. And um, as I mentioned before, this month we ask that um, any donation made in appreciation of this webinar can go towards our access grant fund. We have a $5,000 match challenge and 100% of the funds raised will go towards financial aid so that all who wish to participate in our events have the opportunity to do so. I'm going to send you right now um, a link uh, where you can donate today. I'd also like to take another quick moment to remind you that we are still accepting proposals to present at our 10th annual ACMHE conference in October. You can read the full CFP and learn more about the conference at www.acmheconference.org. The deadline is this coming Monday, May 28th at midnight Pacific time. Thank you again, Stephen, and thank you all for listening. You. Enjoy yeah, the rest of so your much. days. Okay. Thank you, everyone.